Good morning and welcome, a uh, very warm welcome to each of you this morning as we gather here to worship together our Lord, it's hard to hear, how's that, is that better? Okay, our Lord, our risen Savior. Um, this morning, our pastors are, as you know, are in Germany, and we pray that they will have a time of uh, renewal and relaxation together with family and friends. And we also pray for their safe return back to us in a few short weeks. This morning, we will be led in our worship by Jackson Richards at the piano as he leads us as we sing our faith. My name is Mary Hunter, and I will be leading us as we go through our order of worship, as we confess our faith, and my husband, John, will lead us as we further explore the gospel lesson for the day, and um, as it speaks to us, as each of us, as sinners, and in need of forgiveness. This is the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, and the four readings that have been chosen for us for today the Old Testament reading, the Psalm, the New Testament reading, and the Gospel, each of those speaks to um, us as sinners. And in the Old Testament reading, even mighty King David as a sinner and need the forgiveness to the Gospel lesson, which you will hear in the sermon, of a woman who is an outcast in her community in need of forgiveness. So um, we are very thankful that we have a forgiving God who has sent his Savior, Jesus Christ, to make us justified and right in God's eyes. And so with that, we will begin our order of worship with the confession and forgiveness. Please stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, abounding in steadfast love toward us, healing the sick and raising the dead showering us with every good gift. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Just and gracious God, we come to you for healing and life. Our sins hurt others and diminish us. We confess them to you. Our lives bear the sorrow of sin. We bring these also to you. Show us your mercy, O God. Bind up our wounds, forgive our sins, and free us to love for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The Apostle Paul assures us, when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ, nailing the record of our sins to the cross. Jesus says to you, your sins are forgiven. Be at peace and tell everyone how much God has done for you. Please remain standing as we sing our opening hymn, number 823, Praise the Lord, O Heavens.
We continue with worship on page 203, the small numbers in the front of your red hymnal. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. prayer of the day that is found on your celebrate insert. O oh God, throughout the ages, you judge your people with mercy, and you inspire us to speak your truth. By your spirit, anoint us for lives of faith and service, and bring all people into your forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading this morning, the Old Testament reading, speaks to King David, who seduced his neighbor Bathsheba and was responsible for the death of her husband Uriah. God sent the prophet Nathan to confront the king. Nathan tells the king a parable and opens David's eyes to see his own guilt. A reading from 2 Samuel. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife, and she bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. Nathan went to David and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare, and it drank from his cup and lie in his bosom, and was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and the rich man was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. So he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are that man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, 
I anointed you king over Israel. I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child that is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. The Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became very ill. The word of the Lord. The psalm this morning is Psalm 32. I will read the light print, and together we will read the bold print and the refrain. Happy are they whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sin is put away. Happy are they to whom the Lord imputes no guilt and in whose spirit there is no guile. While I held my tongue, my bones withered away because of my groaning all day long. For your hand was heavy upon me day and night. My moisture was dried up as in the heat of summer. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not conceal my guilt. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore, all the faithful will make their prayers to you in time of trouble. When the great waters overflow, they shall not reach them. You are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Do not be like horse or mule, which have no understanding, who must be fitted with bit and bridle, or else they will not stay near you. Great are the tribulations of the wicked, but mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. Be glad, you righteous, and rejoice in the Lord. Shout for joy, all who are true of heart. Then you forgave me the guilt of my sin. The New Testament reading speaks of Paul preaching on the power of God's grace to make us faithful. We are made right with God through Jesus Christ alone, through no work of our own. As a result, Christ's life has become our whole identity. A reading from Galatians chapter 2. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus so that we might be justified by faith in Christ, not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if, in our effort to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I am a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law, so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for as justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. The word of the Lord. Please stand as together we sing the gospel acclamation.
The Holy Gospel according to Luke, beginning with the seventh chapter and the 36th verse. Through a dramatic encounter of rich and poor, righteous and sinner, Jesus uh, teaches the relationship between receiving mercy and responding with a lavish outpouring of love. Jesus also provokes his host by claiming authority to forgive sins. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him, and he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city, who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him once more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, you gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table at him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Soon afterwards, he went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod's steward Chusa, and Susanna, and many others, who provided for them out of their resources. The Gospel of the Lord. May I invite the children to come forward for a time for them. Okay, uh, noticed I was not going to sing that uh, in public. All right, you guys, <clears throat> we're going to talk about people coming over for dinner. Did anybody ever come over for dinner as a guest to your house? Does that happen once in a while? Well, this is in this book, and you see this in your uh, pews. This is a great book, and if you can uh, convince your parents sometime to read it during one of my sermons, then that would be a good thing. <laughs> So here's about someone who invited someone, uh, Jesus over to his house for dinner. And I'll read this a little bit. Jesus was invited to dinner at Simon's house. Thanks for coming, Jesus. Simon led his guest through the dark door to a table. Dinner is served. Now Jesus was ready to eat when he heard a woman at the door. And when she saw Jesus, she started crying. She was known to have done many things wrong. You know what that is, right? Those are sins. Jesus started to eat. Drip, drip, drip. The woman bent over Jesus' feet and cleaned them with her tears. So she was crying a lot, wasn't she? Jesus, uh, please pass the cheese, Jesus said. Wipe, wipe, wipe. The woman dried the tears on his feet with her long, dark hair. Simon was upset. He said, I didn't invite that woman. What is she doing? So Jesus cleared his throat and told a, st told a story. One person owed the bank 500 coins. You know what coins are, right? 
The other person owed 50 coins. The bank canceled the payments for both of them. Who should be more thankful? What do you guys think? The one with the bigger one? Okay. All right. Let's go with the bigger one. And Jesus said, yes, I forgive and forget both big and little mistakes. So he put the hand, his hand on the woman's head. This woman has made many mistakes, and I forgive her. She needs a lot of forgiveness, so she shows me a lot of love. Then he said to Simon, you are my host, but you didn't greet me as a special guest. You have made little mistakes for me to forgive, so you only give me a little love. He said to the woman in a kind voice, you have a strong faith. So it's interesting, isn't it, that Jesus forgives all sins, whether they are big sins or small sins. But people with, who have had bigger sins forgiven sometimes are more appreciative, aren't they? Okay, that's it for today. You can go back to your chairs now. Among the great ironies or even lessons of the Bible is that Jesus, who was without sin, was always accused of being interested only in sinners, the tax collectors, the drunkards, the lowlifes. But it's important to know, as we learn from the gospel and even the children's message, that he was a friend of all sinners, even those who don't consider themselves sinners or hypocrites who think others are sinners. In fact, today's gospel isn't really about forgiving the woman with many sins. The whole village believed she was a sinner, but to teach the Pharisee the less obvious sinner. Back to the gospel for a second. Jesus is dining with the Pharisee, among others, and the woman washes Jesus' feet with her tears, dries them with her hair, puts ointment on them, and kisses them. The Pharisee is watching this and says to himself, this guy, if he's a prophet, he should know that this woman's a sinner. So by thinking that, he is drawing a line. The woman is a sinner, but he himself isn't. In other words, the Pharisee believes Jesus shouldn't be spending time with sinners, but rather with people like him, a non-sinner. A little more background on the Pharisees. They were fastidious guardians of the law. They were people who set the standard to which everybody had to be measured. They were the legalists. They were self-righteous. And the Pharisees had already rendered a verdict on Jesus, determining that the man was a blasphemer. Why? Because he forgave sin. He acted as if he was God, forgiving sins. They hated him because of his message. And so they saw him as somebody who belonged as an outcast. He had stepped on sacred ground, claiming to be able to forgive sin. That was open and outright blasphemy. So the Pharisee considers both the woman and, the G and Jesus to be sinners, but not himself. Jesus, of course, knows this. So he tells the story of the two debtors who had their debts forgiven and asks, which one is more graceful, grateful? The Pharisee, still not getting the point, says, I suppose the one with the greater debt. Now, thinking about today, I suppose it's our own sinful human nature that we like to rank sins and sinners. We create kind of a sin scale, indicating there are various degrees or quality of sins. If we can find sinners who are worse than us, we probably feel better about ourselves. I might say, well, I might be a cheat, but I'm not as bad as that guy over there. Well, yes, I'm a liar, but that guy has done a lot more bad things than I have. We may not use those words directly, but it's fair to say most of us think that. Even because we come to church, we sometimes believe that's a partial atonement for our sins. We're better than those people who don't come to church, right? It also seems as we read many parables, 
we often identify ourselves with the lesser sinner. My favorite case in point is the parable of the prodigal son. You remember the man had two sons. One took his inheritance, spent it on wine, women, and song. The other stayed home and was hardworking and loyal. When the spendthrift son returns home and asks forgiveness, the father kills the fatted calf and throws a party. Of course, we put ourselves in the shoes of the loyal son, don't we? The better son, or maybe even the sinless son. But we aren't sinless. We aren't better. That's the irony of this parable. We're actually the spendthrift son who needs forgiveness. So here's the bad news. We all are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. Minor sin, major sin, we are all in the club. In fact, church could be considered a clubhouse for sinners. We should invite people here who we wouldn't normally invite to a dinner at our house. But there's that trap again, inviting worse sinners than us to church. We're the sinners too, and there isn't a graduated scale that says our sins are better than someone else's. In fact, one could argue that the most unredeemable of all, all of the sins, or all the sinners are those of us who don't think we're sinners and don't need redemption, who think God is pleased with us the way we are. The worst kind of sin may be the sin of self-righteousness, the assumption that by our own religious activities and moral merit, can somehow earn a place in the kingdom of God and that the sacrifice of Christ was unnecessary and foolish. But here's the good news. Jesus saves all sinners. The woman, the Pharisee, the hypocrite, me, you, all of us. The gospel doesn't end there. Jesus has to explain further. The woman is expressing her gratitude with everything she has. Tears, hair, expensive ointment, and kissing his feet. As Jesus describes the woman's gratitude, he's really using it as an example of how ungrateful the Pharisee is. She had no water to wash his feet, no, tra- no towel to dry them. But that doesn't stop her. She weeps with thankfulness, not just a teardrop or two, but enough to wash Jesus' feet and uses her hair to dry them. And she keeps kissing the feet even after spending this money on the ointment which she applied to his feet. The Pharisee offered mostly nothing, no water for his feet, no kiss when he entered the room, no oil for his head. A deep and meaningful appreciation for forgiveness. That might be difficult for some of us, You know, if someone gives us a gift, how do we express our appreciation and thankfulness? Sometimes we think maybe we'll give a gift equal or better at value, maybe at their birthday when they do that. But Jesus talks about expressing appreciation and thankfulness with all our hearts. The two lessons today, one, to recognize our sin, and two, to be grateful with all our heart for his forgiveness. So as we leave church this morning, let's be grateful for that gift. Amen. Um, The hymn of the day, number 824, This is My Father's World. Please stand.
please remain standing as together we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the rest. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. At this time, we will share God's peace with one another, followed by the receiving of our offering. Her response. Let us pray. God of mercy and grace, the eyes of all wait upon you, and you open your hand and bless us. Fill us with good things at your table, that we may come to the help of all in need. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer and Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Faithful God, inspire fidelity in your church 
guard it from temptation, and make it the, a place of safety, welcome, and joy for all. Lord, in your mercy. God of all that is, we encounter you not only in the grandeur of your, cre- of your creation, but in its smallest and quietest parts. Awaken us in your presence all around us. Lord, in your mercy. God of power and might, call the nations of the world to recognize first your authority and justice. Guard all nations from unjust rulers and bring forth your kingdom of righteousness and peace. Lord, in your mercy. God of the lowly, help us recognize hospitality and generosity from unexpected sources, the humanity and goodness of those in prison, the faith and persistence of those who weep. Let our weakness be our strength. Lord, in your mercy. God of new life, as you bring, as you bring newcomers, visitors and seekers into this assembly, give us hearts open to the new people to the new perspectives and gifts they bring. Lord, in your mercy. O God, you have called the saints your own. Gather us with them into your kingdom in the promise of life forever with you. Lord, in your mercy. We lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting your promise to hear us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. There are several announcements that you'll find printed in your worship folder. Yes, you may be seated. Um, I will leave those to your review. Um, One announcement that we did learn last evening uh, at the Saturday night Saturday evening service was that as you pray for those um, of our friends and family of Trinity listed in the um, in the bulletin for comfort and healing, um, please include Joe Thompson. Joe and Judy were visiting family in California, and Joe became ill and was hospitalized while out there in California. Um, And then also too, I want to invite each of you downstairs for coffee and time of fellowship together. And I don't know. I think that we should stand again. If we're going to be marching in the light, it's kind of hard to march when you're sitting. So please stand as we sing our closing hymn. We are marching in the light, number 866.
Thank you.